Dave, obviously coming out of the bye week, you get a chance to reset and you get a chance to kind of go over things that work, went well, didn't go well. What do you feel like was the biggest um, adjustment that you made and the biggest thing that you saw um, on film from this past weekend that gives you, you know, the <laughs> the idea that things are changing? 59 points. I mean, isn't that a big sign that things changed? So... You know, finishing drives, not beating ourselves. We didn't turn the ball over. Um, obviously, the two explosive runs inflate your rushing stats, but we ran the football really well in that game and, and we're balanced. You know, we've been throwing the ball pretty well uh, for the last three games, so it's really not that. It was more about being efficient in other areas on offense. And, uh, you know, I've challenged a lot of people in this building and, and – one of the big things is up front playing, you know, our five guys playing as one unit. And there wasn't one single guy when you watch the film that was a problem. It was different plays, different guys breaking down. And offensive lines that play well play really well together. And I thought our guys did a great job of that in this last game, picking up a lot of movement stunts. They played multiple fronts. As I mentioned last week, I thought Stanford's defensive ends uh, were a problem. And our guys handled them. You know, they did not beat our offensive line one time in pass protection. They beat our tight end one time. But those edges were clean. Our tackles did a great job against some defensive ends, and that was not the case throughout the season. So we've improved in that area, and now it's a new test. I mean, these two ends for Duke are real, and so we got to show up. And you mentioned C.J. Bailey as well. What did you see on film from him that – you know, after obviously talking about it on Saturday night, what did you see on film from him that gave you the notion that he continues his growth in, in different areas as well? Yeah, I mean, I thought he threw the ball uh, really well against Cal, you know, and so that just continued um, from that game to this game. The thing that he's doing better is protecting the ball. You know, as a runner, you saw him have a scramble and, and he's got the, the ball where it should be clamped. And... uh we call the three C's, claw, clamp, and chin, and, and he's putting that on film, double in trouble, and protecting the ball as a runner, you know, and, and got to continue to do that because he can use his legs when he needs to, and and you can't be careless with the football when you do. And so, you know, the passing game piece of it, if we can just give him time, he's going to make stuff happen because he's got vision, eyes, and timing, and he's got guys to throw it to. And it's, you know, when you're not, when you break, you know, break contain um, and try to extend a play with your legs, whether you're running or, or, you know, trying to find somebody to throw the football to, that's when you can get careless with the football quarterback. And that definitely took a step forward in this last game. Thank you. James. Dave, you were able to get uh, Brandon Cisse back in this game. Seems like he gave you a yeah. lot of what he was giving you before the injury. Just kind of discuss your play from him. Yeah, he had two deep ball uh, opportunities, broke up both of them. Uh, you know, poise, patience, timing, and strain to get the ball out. And yeah, Brandon's uh, a really good player. We're thankful he's back and uh, glad we had an opportunity to get him healthier. He's feeling good. Um, so having that rotation back at corner, especially when you're playing a team that like this week that, you know, will go fast. Uh, they're, they're a team that, on film, you can see he's trying to snap the ball as quickly as possible at times, not always, but at times. And so having, a, you know, a little bit of depth at corner does help, you know, with Aiden. And obviously, um, we've been able to get some other corners going. And Corey Coley's been out, you know, but uh, that rotation's been helpful, you know, throughout the year. Um, and the guys – I think, you know, in college football, I was talking to Peyton before the game. I was like, how's your body? He's like, coach, I only play like 40 plays a game. He's like, this is easy. In college, we played 70 to 80, you know, and uh, it was kind of crazy to hear that. But, you know, as a corner, if you have to play that many snaps, man, it, it's tough. A lot of those plays are running plays where you're sprinting down the field. So having a little bit of a rotation there is very helpful. And I wanted to ask you, with the score, you were able to get some younger guys in yeah. for some limited snaps. I, not a lot of tape, but did did anyone show you much or were you able to kind of really evaluate a few guys there? Not really. I mean, it was good to see him get in the game. I mean, it was fun to see. And, guys, I showed some of those clips to the team in the team room on Sunday. And, you know, 
that <laughs> you've seen how excited they are to make plays, you know, I mean, and some of them are older guys too, you know, Demarcus Jones gets in, has a spin move and all the guys are going crazy for him. And, you know, some of the young defensive players got in there. Cannon Lewis had a TFL, got up and went crazy and, and the guys are all cheering and, so, you know, it's fun for them, and, and there's a lot of hard work. And so when they do get that reward and uh, that taste of what it's like to be on the field, we are able to play a lot of guys. So that's always a great thing, you know, when you get – we didn't empty the bench, but we got a lot of guys on the field, that's for sure. Thanks, Dave. Ethan? Hey, Dave, you mentioned how Davin is leading the country in forced fumbles. He's also already equaled his career high for sacks. I was just wondering what you think he's doing – particularly well this season that's leading to all this disruption and game-changing plays? Well, I think his stamina uh, is one of the factors. You know, some of these sacks have taken place at the end of games and in the fourth quarter when some D linemen may be too tired. He's not tired at all. You know, his stamina is, is impressive. Uh, I think his film study and preparation has helped him. Uh, there's no doubt uh, his ability to, to – not just kind of be a one trick pony in the pass rush. He's added a few elements uh, to his pass rush game. That's helped him. Um, and just experience, you know, I think going through what you do as a player and you get in that last year, you've had a lot of game reps. I don't have it in front of me, but he's played a lot of football here. And so that experience pays off over time. Uh, the thing that I, you know, said in front of the team yesterday, the thing that's most impressive, not just about his sacks is, and he doesn't waste one opportunity when he gets there to strip the football. I mean, the number of times over my career you've seen a guy hit the quarterback and not even attempt to rake the ball out, it's frustrating. You know, I mean, it's the one guy that a lot of times is not in a good position to, to secure the ball because he's trying to throw it. And you have an opportunity there to steal one. And, and Davin's done a great job at doing that. And that's why the stats are the way they are. He's not wasting opportunities. JC. Callan Smith was able to be very busy with extra points and kickoffs, which is always good. Uh, what kind of went into him getting his chance on Saturday? That's just how it worked out last week. You know, Colin did a good job stepping up when we needed him. And, you know, we'll see if we do the same thing again this week. Not going to really get into that uh, to help our opponents at all. But, you know, Cano has been solid all year. And um, Colin's a guy that, no matter what you need, he tries to do it for you. Uh, he's been a kickoff weapon. I, I think in the game we had a few crazy kicks that came off his foot, and I'm glad he finished the way he did because we needed him to have a deep kick after the one penalty that we shouldn't have had. Uh, Bonehead played by one of our guys, and you know, Colin's been a weapon on kickoff, and, and it's happy for him you know, to get in the game and, and be 100% and help the team win. Noah? Hey, Dave, you mentioned Davin, I guess, you know, taking advantage of every opportunity to go for the ball. Is that a coaching point that you guys stressed out, or is that just him just making plays? No, it's a player taking coaching um, and applying it to the field. You know, I think every single time you come to practice at NC State, if you're there for the first period, you're going to see ball security on offense – and you're going to see takeaway circuit on defense. And you're, one of those circuit drills is takeaways. It's rushing a bag with a ball and knocking the ball out of the, the bag and stripping it. It's a muscle memory thing that we do every Tuesday at NC State. Some players take drill work to teamwork, teamwork to the games, and some players don't. And that's why some players end up being all conference and some players don't. You know, and Davin's a guy that takes coaching. And he wants to be great at what he does. And so the details of the game apply to those type of guys, you know. And you saw that with Bradley Chubb his senior year. He forced a ton of fumbles. And, yeah, I mean, I just think the best players are about the details. They are. And there's accountability to them. And it's fun to see, man. Uh, there's nothing better as a former defensive coach than the sack force fumble play. I love that. I mean, that to me is a great playing football for a defensive lineman or a strip, you know, from a linebacker coming off the edge growing up. Derek Thomas was like, I idolized that dude when he played for the Chiefs, and he was a master of that, just the tomahawk strip coming over the top. And so I love seeing our guys do that. Rob? 
Yeah, Dave, I know you were at the Duke basketball game in Dallas a few months ago. Do you sense now that Duke is an assigned rival, that this is becoming a bigger rivalry or more of a rivalry befitting two schools that are so close together? Well, now that we get to play each other every year, I think you can see that, Rob. You know, I mean, in the past, like I told you guys before they changed all the stuff, I mean, we I'd play them once every seven years, so it's kind of hard to see them that way as a rival when you never play. Uh, but now we get to play every year. So that will add to that, you know, being as close as we are to Durham and, and as close as Durham is to Raleigh, it's natural to have that kind of feel. Um, and I'm glad we do, you know, definitely glad we do because uh, it's been one of the weirder parts of being the head coach here was how little we played some of the teams that were drivable, you know, to our university and very thankful that the ACC did change that format. So we get to play each other every year. And a follow-up, sir, just a little off topic, but you did, as I mentioned, you went to the game in Dallas. Just describe that experience watching NC State and Duke at that game. You seemed like you had a really good time. Yeah, me and my son Luke went and had a blast. I mean, I've said this before, it was uh, it was a great environment. Our fans were awesome. And, and you know, one of the cooler parts of that was sitting in the uh, section I was in with the parents of our players right behind me, right beside me, and, and just hearing them cheer each other's sons on. And um, I really found that refreshing. You know, a lot of times parents are obviously going to cheer for their kids, but, man, they were so excited for each other's sons that were playing and cheering each other's sons on and high-fiving each other when their sons would make a play. And I, I just thought that was really cool. I actually told that story to our parent group. Um, awesome environment, and it was a lot of fun. It was great to see a, a matchup like that and obviously the outcome as it went our way. But, yeah, I enjoyed that a lot. Jaden? Yeah, Dave, the last uh, – this season and last season, obviously, you know, big uh, big turnarounds after the after the bye. You know, what do you think contributed to kind of the, the struggles at the beginning of the year and turning around at the end? You know, is that, a, is that just like figuring – stuff out as a team as the season progresses yeah I, I mean I know that the two seasons are uh alike in the turnaround piece of it but they're two different teams with two different problems and uh last year I think the offensive problems were pretty documented with what happened at quarterback and so I don't need to rehash that um I think this year a lot of different things happened and um it was just unique how things kind of went and, you know, we've been searching for four quarters of football. I mean, man, we just played well and, and, uh, and doses and, and not well in doses. And it's, it's really hard to put a finger on why we weren't better earlier in the year. And I think the chemistry of so many new parts is part of it. You know, uh, obviously when you bring in as many, players as we did um not because uh we had an exodus of sorts but that's just how it worked out 40 some new players it, it's uh, it's college football now and some things didn't go our way you know some weird things happened and we're we're right there in the game at Tennessee and and you have a weird play uh go the other way and we don't respond well and I think the leadership of the team didn't take form you know um and now it kind of has. And, you know, each team evolves differently. Sometimes you can just gangbusters and here you go. And, and sometimes it takes time. And last year was different than this year in some ways. Obviously, it feels similar to you guys because it's coming off of a bye. But uh, I felt like we were getting better going into that Wake Forest game this year. I mean, I thought we were about to put our foot on the gas. And then – you know, what happened to Grayson happened. And, and that really was bigger than people understand uh, in the moment and um, a tough ordeal. And I felt like we were going to blow those guys out. I really did. Uh, the way that we prepared practice, the game plan that we had, the way the first drive was going, all of it. And it just, you know, kind of came apart and we didn't, finished the game, didn't find enough ways to win, obviously, in the next game. And and then you have that chance to reset. Okay, all right, man, here, here we go. We're really close, you know. And sometimes you just got to get a win 
for them to believe it. And then here we go again, get another one. And now momentum, momentum's a big thing in sports. It's a big thing. And it builds confidence. And, and a lot of these athletes, I mean, that mental part of the game, the confidence piece of the game is it's massive. And so our quarterback is playing with confidence and that spreads, you know, it's a wide net. It's a wide net. And so we have that right now. You know, we have some definite enthusiasm. Um, we have some guys that are feeling better, healthy. And now we need to go play against a really good team. I mean, it's watching these guys on defense. And I thought Cal was really good on defense. They are statistically. But these guys are really good. This is going to be a really tough game. Hey, just a couple more, JC. You, you've seen roster management evolve the last several years. What is it like knowing that your seniors are going to be seniors and that you don't have to worry about if they're making a COVID year decision or, or different <laughs> things? That this year, is it any easier to handle roster management going into December? Man, I wish it was. You know, um, if people could really understand how screwed up college football is right now, that would be the one area that somebody should do a huge story on. Um, you have your seniors, and and obviously when you put it in the old days, you all right, you got 20 spots, these guys are leaving. There may be two or three guys that go pro early. Um, maybe a couple guys that, you know, transfer that are graduates. So, all right, we got 25, let's go sign them. And you go find those guys, and then you have a signing period you know, whenever that might fall, it was in February, then it moved to mid-December, and, and now it's the first week of December. And uh, this was all pre-portal, obviously. And you'd sign your high school players, you know, and, and then you'd develop the guys, and your December was about home visits to the kids that were committed and bowl prep if you were in a bowl game and, and sometimes hire new coaches when guys got jobs somewhere else or if you made changes. But now you finish the year with your seniors and, and you go sign who you think you need from the high schools and you sign them in the first week of December. Um, and you're not allowed to do home visits in December anymore. So they took that from us. Um, and then all of a sudden the portal opens after you sign your high school players. So let's say we signed 20 high school guys first week of December. And you thought that's what you needed. Well, you may have five to 25 guys decide to go pro or go in the portal. And you, the high school guys are pretty much gone, you know. So whether you wanted to sign more portal guys or not, that's where you're at. And on top of that, our roster now goes from 85 to 105. But it doesn't go to 105 until May. And so oh, you can only have 85 in December – but you're supposed to have 105 in May, but the signing date's in December. So tell me how that makes sense. That's where college football is right now. It's it's crazy, you know. So it's really not like roster management. I mean, it's roster mismanagement is what's happening, and it's not coach's fault, you know. It's the rules that have been levied do not make sense, and I say it all the time. I say it all the time. You know, you wish that common sense was more common. You wish that we could get the power four commissioners in a room with the top 15 coaches that people think can make decisions to help college football and just let's fix this. You know, let's put together a calendar that actually makes sense for recruits, for current players on rosters and for teams so that they can build a team, a program that, you know, doesn't have, have – four ways to leave the program and only one way to add players uh, and doing it in a time where it doesn't even make sense on the calendar. So it's frustrating. It's really frustrating. You know, for somebody that's poured 12 years into a program, you sit there and you're like, all right, how are we going to have this thing ready for next year? I mean, it's fluid. I mean, daily, when you hit that December one and you sign your guys on the seventh and then that window opens on the ninth, and then we start school the first week of January. So you got to have that thing turned around really quick. And then all spring, you just 
continue to recruit, you know, so that you can try to fill it all the way up to wherever you're going to fall in that 85 to 105 bucket based on your athletic director. It's, it's different times right now. And it's going to be fun to watch, I guess, for the media and for all the recruiting pundits and everybody else. But as a coach, it's different. It's really different. 